Mike's been doing cool stuff with AI forever, and um, it's really good to get him to talk here. And so I'm, what I'm going to do now is let him talk here, because that's an obvious choice. And you need to stand there so the video can get you fantastic. <laughs> There we go. If you're laughing, you can't be upset. It's great. All right, so I'm going to pass over the mic. You should clap really loud, and then you should listen to the words coming out of his mouth. Apparently, that'll be good. <laughs> This, this was a 20 minute talk, so don't be alarmed if I skip some slides. Um, thanks very much for the intro. Uh, yes, I'm Michael Cook, you can call me Mike. And I want to talk to you today about dreaming. Um, not the kind of dreaming that uh, Jake's going to do when he goes home at the end of the day, shattered and, and falls into his bed, um, because he's worked very, very hard. But um, this kind of dreaming, and the kind of dreaming that uh, the Queen of Hearts talks about in Alice in Wonderland. Um, when she talks about believing six impossible things before breakfast, the kind of dreaming where you start to think about what is possible and what we could do and what might not be able to do but we should try anyway. Um, and I'm really excited about this kind of, kind of dreaming. Um, and I guess that's because in my day job, I am a scientist and a researcher. I work at Goldsmiths, which is part of the University of London down in New Cross. And um, for the last four years, I've been doing my PhD and I've been building a piece of software called Angelina. Um, and the idea behind that software is that it designs games on its own. And not just like the technical parts of games, but I also want it to be able to do the artistic and personal parts of games, the critical and creative things. I want it to make games and think about the meaning that's behind them um, and try and convince you that there's meaning behind them. And, you know, it's a, it's a PhD. It's been pretty difficult. And so far, I don't know about meaning, um, a lot of the games feature like Peter Mandelson or floating cruise ships and things like that. And it's not, I mean, the, the, there, is, there is meaning in there, but um, it's, it's early days. Um, but it's good fun. I, I like doing it. So for instance, this is the uh, Independent Games Festival, or it's the logo. I mean, I've tried to find Google images of it, but there aren't any. Um, so I, I, I assume this is one of them. Um, and you know, every year, if you're not aware, in California, the world of independent games gets together to um, commemorate something, um, and normally indie games are involved. And it's a really important time for people if you are an independent game developer. And to be given an award is, a, is quite an honor, because if nothing else, it means that your peers um, have judged you to be worthy, to be part of a critical community. And you know, I'm interested, maybe Angelina could enter the IGF one day. And what would it take for Angelina to win one of those awards? What would it mean? Not because people thought, oh, Angelina's really cool, but because I actually thought the game was a contribution to games as a medium. And they were like, this, this software should be recognized for what it's done as a, as a creative entity. That would be really cool. Um, Christos has already brought up uh, That Dragon Cancer, so I won't ask you to guess what this is from. Um, but that Dragon Cancer is, is an incredibly moving and emotional game, and, and it hammers home um, the human aspect of video games. Lots of people ask me whether Angelina will ruin um, video games by it, removing the need for human designers. But of course, that Dragon Cancer reminds us of the many reasons why we play games, and we play games to connect to people. But because I'm a callous and cold-hearted scientist, I also wonder what would happen if Angelina tried to make a game that had the same level of, of personality and, and humanness um, as part of it. Could it make a game about something as serious as cancer, and how you relate to it, and actually believe that um, it, it understands you in the same way that you feel like you have a connection to Ryan Green, the creator of that right cancer. Because um, games are about connecting with people, they're, they're an army. No matter what it is, even something like Call of Duty, it, you know that it's made by human beings, so you have certain assumptions about it. I've gone on for far too long, but the, the summary is that I get to ask this question, what does the future look like? Um, and we often think about this question, whether or not we know about it. We often dream about what might be happening in the next 12 months, or five years, or 25 years. Mm -hmm. But today I really want you to think about this question while I'm doing the rest of my talk, because uh, I'll come back to it later. And I want you to think about what you want games to look like in five years, or 25 years, or when you've retired and you're asking your grandchildren what they think games are going to look like. And then we're going to take a detour. So I sat down with a, a journalist two before I go on. This is now <laughs> um, What I mean by this is people who play games, right? I mean this in the broadest possible sense. If you ever um, played Stick in the Mud in the playground, um, I consider you a gamer. I, I have to do that. Um, right, so earlier this year I was talking to a journalist um, at a games event, and I, I said, you know, gamers aren't unreasonable enough. They, they don't demand enough. And the journalist looked at me like I was mad. 
And they said, well, really, like all gamers do is demand things. <laughs> That's just the <laughs> they're mean, they're angry, they're negative, they just whine about stuff all day. All people say is how demanding gamers are. And of course, there's, there's a difference between like this is this is the two <laughs> subreddits, uh, and it's oh, just a stream of requests. <laughs> it's just a stream of requests for, for Valve to fix things, or change things, or hire people, or fix things back because they didn't like the way they didn't fix the first time. <laughs> just a stream of assumptions that, that we know better than the people making this game, and they're really petty things as well a lot of the time. Things that don't really matter, um, and yeah, they get fixed a lot, and they do get listened to, even though they're kind of inane and, and tiny. Um, I'm not suggesting, I think that we've slipped into kind of a comfortable relationship here where we agree with the games industry to ask for things that are fairly easy to do. And in return, they listen to us and do them and make us feel good about the fact that they've been done. And like, I don't want to suggest that there's like some kind of capitalist conspiracy where the games industry <laughs> is crushing you on the foot and making you not ask for a significant thing. They're, they're crushing your dreams to make you be appreciated when they just change the color of something or retexture a gun. Um, but I do think that there is this sort of relationship that benefits both of us, where we ask for something very simple, and then every year they do it, and then we feel like we're being looked after, and we never really ask for anything more complicated. Not so much ask me no questions and I'll tell you no lies, but um, you don't ask for the moon on a stick, and I'll pretend to listen to you every year. And that's great. Um, for some things, it means that you can make a game like Far Cry 3, which is um, a game about running around an open world and uh, shooting some mans and taking over some camps. And then a year or two later, you can make Far Cry 4, which is a slightly <laughs> better looking game about running around an open world and shooting some mans and taking over some camps, plus there are elephants. <laughs> <laughs> That's, and you know, I wish it had co-op, and now Far Cry 4 is going to have co-op when we did it, read it, and there's huge posts everywhere. And, and that's, that's great. Um, and you know, if that's one year there's Call of Duty, and then next year there's Call of Duty. And you can't even tell, those two are actually in opposite chronological order. This, was, this came before the previous one, but you probably didn't even notice. Like, who, who really pays attention anymore? Um, and like, there's an Assassin's Creed game out, which is great. Um, except this one, he's on a boat. <laughs> and now he's French. <laughs> And this is great, and I, but for the record, I don't have a problem with this. Um, I think there's a, there's a place for these games, and, and I, I love them. And if there was a new release of Spelunky every year, I would buy it, no matter which like, country Spelunky was set in that particular year. Um, but I think there is something strange going on. So Polygon um, wrote this article back in February, 2014's most innovative games, by the people making them. So they got the developers to describe what was innovative about them. And, um, I just find it really interesting the kind of language that they use. So here are a few um, choice quotes. I'm using my timer up, Jake, so I have no idea how fast I am. Um, but this is this is Destiny, which came out this year. Sweet. Yes. 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 I got loads of these. I'm going to read this out. I know this is bad bad talk form, but I want to read this out. A kick-ass shooter that has RPG elements. This is Destiny, by the way, out in game stores now. <laughs> menacing alien combatants, a killer story, match-made co-op activities. Um, challenging endgame content, competitive multiplayer, and is tied together in a persistent world. In other words, it's an FPS. And, <laughs> and like, like, I'm sure that, that in many cases, the, the, it could be unique the way that these have been combined, where there's a little bit of dust on top and sugar. But it's not like this. Is, this was at the top of Polygon's list of innovative games in 2014. And it's an FPS. Um, what about Tom Clancy's The Division? So this has actually got some interesting ideas. Um, but what I thought was really interesting was the thing that the developers chose to, to talk about most prominently, which is we are building what we want to become the largest and most realistic open world New York City ever created in a game, which, to, to mention New York City specifically seems weirdly uh, specific, but basically it's bigger than it was before, and it looks better, it's more realistic than it was before. And those are the two things that we're gonna say are the most innovative things about our game. Uh, Evolve, we'll, we'll get to this a bit faster. Evolve has a unique co-op versus lone wolf formula. I can't think of any games that had uh, a team of people versus uh, a lone wolf. Um, or what about Telltale's Game of Thrones? Like, this kind of shocked me, because I like these guys. Innovation's going to come through your choices, rippling through the narrative, <laughs> harder and more unexpectedly than any game we've done so far. In other words, it's exactly like all the other games you've played in us, but we've spent a bit more time on it. And I'm sure it's going to great, but it doesn't scream innovation to me. So 
you, you kind of come back to this question of what does the future look like? And at the start, I was talking about all these crazy things that I get paid to think about because universities like absorb risk. No one cares if I fail. Like, I, mean, I understand that. Like, I understand that I'm extremely privileged with my job because I don't have to make money at the end of the day. And the universities know that. They kind of expect me not to, in a way. And <laughs> honestly, like, I had grant, like, I had a grant application come back. Um, and you basically just get told, like, if, if, it's, if any of this was actually possible, I probably would have rejected the grant. Um, the, the fact that it just sounds ludicrous, sure, go and do it. If you're watching online and are it related to scientific funding or government in any way, all of my grants are incredibly uh, plausible and will impact the digital economy and the creative industries. <laughs> <laughs> to, to butcher a quote from Deus Ex, which, by the way, is graffiti in the laboratories downstairs, also butchered, um, unless this inherits it from somewhere else. I'm horribly under read, so it could be the case. Um, I've wind on all day about where the innovation isn't. Um, so, where should you go to find it? Um, I'm going to show you some places. These are not where the future are, but maybe you can see the future on the horizon from. Um, Game jams are, are obvious, and I know that they happen all the time, and so they're kind of boring now, um, because there's just too many of them, and you, you probably don't pay attention. But it's really worth checking in on some of them. Um, recently, I hosted a jam called Prop Jam, and all I did was I said, wouldn't it be fun if you all made things? And then a bunch of really talented people came, and they did that, and I had nothing to do with it. Um, <laughs> but like, this, is, this is was made by Tom Coxon. This is a game called Dreamer of Electric Sheep. Um, and it's a procedurally generated text adventure. It pulls down information live from the internet. It's Sean here, I think Sean's left. Um, it pulls down information live from the internet while you're playing, including the images that appear up. So you're in a bookstore, a reader is here, poetry is here. If you leave the bookstore, you might end up in like Maine in the USA, and it will find out what is in Maine, and it will tell you that that is there, and you can eat swimming pools, and, and nightmares come along and haunt you. And this is kind of broken, a bit like my research. Like, it's broken all over the place, and it's not really like a great idea, but it's got loads of great ideas in it, and it's showing you a path that we haven't been down, and it's taking a few steps along that path. And that's all you really need to do to inspire people. Because if you don't show people what's possible, and you don't fail at that along the way, then no one even knows that this is a direction you can go in. And I think this is the number one problem with us always asking the games industry for things that are possible is that we don't know that these avenues even exist. We can't conceive of them, because we've stopped kind of exercising our imagination. <coughs> um, I fear like this uh, audience is, is way more twitter burst than I thought it would be. Um, so this, this uh, slide may be completely moot. But every weekend, um, developers around the world tweet screenshots of what they're working on using the hashtag screenshots out today. So 1,100 screenshots came up last weekend. These are projects that are happening right now they might be coming out next week, they might be coming out next year, they might never see the light of day in many cases. But you can interact with the developers right now and tell them what you think about what they're doing and how great it looks. And you can ask them whether they're going to do something. You can think of your dreams of the things that you want to happen into the future of the games industry. And you can ask them whether they can do it. And they might, because they're a bunch of crazy fuckers. And if you say to them, wouldn't it be great if your game did XYZ? They might just leap at it, much like Tom did. Um, Tom is a full-time game developer, I believe. Um, he's working on a game called Lena's Inception, which is an incredible procedural Zelda-like game. And he just does this, he knocks this stuff out in his spare time. Um, he's an incredibly talented dude. The last thing I wanted to say was, this is a, a, a shout out for myself, which is incredibly, um, yeah, I know, incredibly lame. Um, but if you want to know what's going on in research, I have a regular series which I'm reviving soon called Saturday Papers, where I take um, a research paper that I think, I mean, in theory, it's not supposed to be applicable to games for the next 10 or 15 years. And I try and write it up in a way that might make it a bit more accessible, or summarize it, or get rid of the equations that are all over the page, that no one really wants to be there, including the author, um, and just say, this is the idea that they had. Here's where you can go and talk to them. And there's stuff like procedurally generating puzzles for pontific adventure games, or generating new classes for role-playing games, classes that you'll never have thought of. One of the classes they came up with was a guy who applies loads of aura to himself, and then charges at the enemy and dies, and the aura is just <laughs> spread out in a cloud in front of him. And then he gets revived later by his party once the fight's on. What a great idea for an RPG class. I've got a lot of books about this stuff, and I've never seen anything like that before. Um, anyway, this is crazy research that I hope might spark inspiration. But ultimately, all of this stuff I've just shown are other people's ideas of what the future is. Right? And although you can get in touch with developers and researchers and, and tell them what you think and, and tell them what, what you think about what they're doing, um, the point of my talk was that 
It's about your vision of the future, no one else's. And so this really was the most important slide in the whole talk. Because what I need you to do between now and next morning's breakfast is I need you to think of six impossible things you want games to do in the next few years. And I need you to tell people about them. I need you to talk about them on podcasts and tell, make Reddit threads about them. I need you to tweet about them and discuss it with all the people in this room and tell the developers that you know and try and do them yourself. And they are impossible, many of those things you're going to dream up. And it doesn't matter, because when attempting to do them, you will create insane games about um, the UPorn API or <laughs> fees and weather effects. And like, it, it'll, be, it'll be crazy. And that'll be great. And it won't work. And you won't think a commercial franchise of the size of Far Cry. But you will improve games for five years, 25 years, or maybe even your grandchildren's games. That's me. Was that? How was that? That was fantastic, but you should ask the question right. now, because everyone's probably got votes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if that was a bit breathless. Are there any questions? So one of the one of the best things I found about game jams is <clears throat> you get 2,000, 3,000, some of the big ones, of particularly people who don't often like games, but they have ideas. How do we find the ideas that they've had, given that you're, you're now looking at a huge body of work? It's really easy to, to lose the individual. The overall game didn't quite work, but that one idea was genius. How do we stop that getting lost in what is a, an ever increasing mass of idea generating games? So um, there's kind of two elements to that. The first problem is that Loon Dare gets like 2,500 entries. And um, what you'll basically do is you'll look at the people who won every category and everyone else will just get ignored. And Project has no ratings for exactly that reason because I didn't want it to be a loser. Um, but by the same margin now, you have 136 people who didn't win or lose, and how do you work out um, which ones to look at? It's really hard, and I don't have a good answer. There are some amazing people, um, shout out in particular to Jupiter Hadley. She follows around um, game jams and just plays every single entry and lets plays onto YouTube, even if it's just for a minute. And that's incredible. Um, but it still doesn't solve the visibility problem. And even, like you say, if you come across a game like um, Tom Coxon's Dreamer of Electric, um, how do you extract the good ideas from that? I think you need more events, a bit like this actually, a bit like video games, where you can just take up something that was a bit mad, like the API talk that we had, and dissect it, and all the people in this audience will get their own ideas of what to take away from it. So the Peter Mandelson game I showed you earlier, that actually used the Guardian API to um, read newspaper articles, and it read an article about Peter Mandelson, and that was why I downloaded that image off Google. <laughs> and like, seeing that API talk um, has like, sparked something up for me. So what I'd love is, I'd love Video Brains to become this franchise that runs all over the country. Um, <laughs> because I think it's great. Cool. I think it's great. And Jake, Jake will obviously personally be at every single one. <laughs> Uh, I think stuff like this is great. I, it's, it's a difficult question for me. I, I don't know the answer. And the reason I started the Saturday Papers was because I was like, no one, why, no one shares these. How are people going to hear about these cool research ideas? Well, we've got exactly the same problem in, in games and game jams. Um, yeah, if you've got ideas, let me know. You said a lot about like what you think other people should say instead. So what would you want if you could like ask for one kind of game thing? Um, so I gave a, a talk this year at Indie Development, and the title, and initially the title was um, something like, you know, lessons learned from doing a PhD in ultimately game generation. And then I was like, you know, I might never get to give one of these talks ever again. So I reached to and the talk was generate everything. And the, web, the, the talk's basic premise was, everything in your game, just strip it out and just replace it with a generator for it. Like puzzles, names, dialogue, and textures, I don't care, because like, you'll find amazing stuff. And, that's what I basically push for, which is kind of obvious because I, I, everything I do is procedural. I realize it's, it gets boring after a while. But um, I, like, think of something that you would never dare hand over to a procedural generator and then do it. So, uh, that would be my recommendation. Including real world games, actually. We had um, some, not, not quite real world, tabletop games, like board games and uh, just physical games. People ask, can I enter prop jam? And I was like, yeah, I have no idea how that works, but yeah. <laughs> and one of them, they're like, Maybe there's something in that as well. Procedurally generated physical real world things. Yeah. And there was a question at the back. Do you think there is a way of getting more mainstream studios to invest in projects that are, for lack of a better word, doomed to failure just to generate something interesting? Because obviously the universities they have accepted with that, but they're slightly removed from the industry. Um, I am not sure. Um, I am sure about something which is that 
And I know this is going to sound really horrible, I don't care. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't know, and I've seen people struggle at it for a long time. And I hope Alan won't mind me pointing him out, but if you want to hold your hand up. Um, Alan is my industrial consultant on my current grant. Normally that is held by like massive game studios and we pretend that they're consulting with us and they don't really help anyone as far as I can tell. <laughs> it's just a waste of time and money because they don't want to change, they don't really want to use our research. In the majority of cases, I know there are, there have been some good ones. Um, but I like having Alan to sit down and tell me about game design. I learn a lot from him and I wrote an article years and years ago where I said indie developers and scientists are basically the same people and they have the same job. Um, because they do experimental things and they're rewarded for the fact that they take risks um, and it's only like the 1% that you need to have a really great breakthrough idea. I don't know about mainstream, I really don't know. I, I love it when it happens. For instance, I think Bethesda are very quietly quite innovative. They don't do much, but every now and again Skyrim will have something which you wouldn't expect a, a massive developer to put in their games, like their procedural quest locations from Skyrim. It's something very tiny, but it shows that they're thinking about it. Maybe you have to kind of target the developers that show willingness and just go all in with them. Um, I don't know, but it's difficult. Um, maybe stuff like Double Fine's Amnesia Fortnite is good as well, where they just open themselves up to the fact that for the next two weeks, what they do might not make a profit. Who knows? We're just going to make something. And then they see something come out of that, hopefully. <coughs> I get very ranty and horrible sometimes. But I, I mean, I've had, uh, I've had some drinks tonight, and it's time for a night. So <laughs> if there's a time I'm going to be ranty about the industry, it'll probably be tonight. I apologize if I've offended anyone. But yeah. I think that's it. That's, that's very much. much. I, I just want to take it away before you get really yelly. <laughs> <laughs>